members, and welcome to the Liberty Mike Podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I'm here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? I, I think the truth is that if you got your Doppler out, you might be able to figure out where we are. <laughs> oh, yeah? You think so? Well, I don't know if the thunder comes through on the microphones or not. Oh, yeah. Um, it's come, it's, it's, we're getting ready to have a storm out there. Mike yeah. may Mike may very well lose power. I may, I lost power this morning for no apparent reason. Oh yeah, for so, twenty minutes or something while I was getting ready for work today. That's no fun. Yeah, um, I was like, what the hell? It's not. It's like the sun's out. Yeah, all right. Of course, that doesn't mean anything for our local power company. They're terrible. <laughs> yeah. Um, at my office is in the same city, and uh, the the tech guy is always complaining about the um, the spikes. Yeah. Like all the surges that happen throughout the day for no reason whatsoever. <laughs> right. It's just like they can't maintain any kind of consistency in the and delivery of power. Yeah. Um, it's supposed to be really bad for your equipment and stuff too, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've got all kinds of filters on to, to try prevent to keep the spikes, it consistent. But yeah. yeah. Oh, and uh, the other good news, I guess, is since the last podcast, we had a nice week off. Yeah. Um, I, I'm like. I almost finished the entire Foundation trilogy in the intervening time. Nice. I like the original trilogy. There's more books than that, but yeah. the original Foundation trilogy. I'm like 40 pages from the end of the third book, so. Well, very good. Yeah. So it was time well spent then. Yeah, I think so. Like I, yeah, it was nice to it was nice to just read some science fiction and not have to worry about what was going on in the news and yeah. not feel like pressed to like get to information on a topic. Media. Yeah. Um. Before the, I mean, I say that it's like, you know, the truth is, everybody out there, that we don't really decide on topics until we're here. Pretty much. I mean, and then we the conversation kind of goes where it goes. Yeah, we go out on Tuesdays and we talk about things that have been in the news that might be of interest. Yeah. But, but the truth is, like, we don't we don't really establish topics until. Until we're like setting up. Yeah, right. <laughs> and even then, sometimes and, we don't. And then it's kind of like, well, what you got this week? <laughs> yeah. Well, I got this. Like, well, I don't know. What you think? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then, yeah, then it, it's certainly not scripted. I, and then it just I becomes. Think that that's probably overly apparent. Yeah. Um, well, and then it just kind of becomes a conversation from there. Yeah. So. Yeah. And I, even the, the the solo podcast that I've done, I don't script. Um, I don't yeah. I really should give myself an outline. I think that they would be better. But the, the conversation is just a lot easier. Yeah. Um, I, I'm I'm much more comfortable just kind of talking it out than I am delivering a lecture, although people that know me know that I... <laughs> you, you, you don't steer away from a good lecture, right? <laughs> I don't. <laughs> um, but I was going to say, uh, if the power does go out, yeah. one of the other things that I received be- since the last podcast... Yeah. Was a whole box full of chem lights. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. I've got thirty something chem lights, I think. Yeah. So. Well, well, and since we're not hooked up to any power right now to record this, we can just yeah, continue on. The exactly. biggest problem is, is we're going to lose the life support. Oh yeah. Which is the air conditioning. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Uh, uh, at least we're not in the hottest recording from the hottest room in the house anymore, though. This is true. And I, I will say. Um, a lot of appreciation for those of you that did reach out in the meantime. Um, oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, thank you. It, it is nice to know that you're being heard. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, and we almost ended up recording last week anyway. Yeah. <laughs> but decided, no, let's go ahead and take the break. Like, yeah, let's not press it. Exactly. <laughs> Just cause I'm feeling good about this today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, it was good to have a week off. Like I say, I, 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 I like I say, I didn't really do any. I, I, if you want to know what I did, I messed with my car. <laughs> like yeah. that's I, I had, I took some, some Corvette time. So. I read. I watched some movies. I, I watched some bad movies. I watched some good movies. Yeah. Good ish movies is what I should say. Actually, I don't think I really saw anything that I was like, man, that was great. Yeah. Um, Nothing but I did see some you things. You didn't go that see like, Barbie. Not yet. Oh yeah, is it on your list? No. <laughs> No, oh, it's okay. Not. Um, uh, you said that like it may be. Like, <laughs> I'd, I'd take uh, I'd take your youngest if you hadn't forbade her from going. I did not forbade her from going. <laughs> I, she's gonna end up going to see it, dude. Like yeah. it's gonna happen. Like, I mean, I, I, I'm actually curious. 
I, I so am I. Like the reviews I've heard have been have just been horrible. Yeah. Um, uh, the big term that I keep hearing is bait and switch. Mm. Um, which I mean, I've seen a ton of advertising. Like I mean, they have done an amazing job of like just shoving this movie down our throat. Um, so I'm curious to see if it's really as bad as it's being portrayed as. Yeah, the the roaming millennial or whatever her screen name used to be. Um, I did listen to a review from her, and she said something like how they managed to not in any of the advertisement, any of the marketing, because they they did a ton of marketing. Oh, ton, it. yeah. Um, how they managed to not reveal that it was a um, feminist, anti- anti-patriarchy movie yeah. was completely beyond her. She said those two terms are probably each used a hundred times in that film. Really? <laughs> and so how they managed to, uh, to slice together enough scenes to do like a good marketing campaign without these words coming up was just amazing. <laughs> uh, a comment I saw on the, um, what's the guy that you like so much? The, the critical drinker, the critical drinker. Yeah. Like, so I watched his review and then like the top comment on it was this movie, m- this movie came out same weekend as Oppenheimer mm-hmm. and that it's amazing that Oppenheimer was like 70% political and this movie was more political than it was. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, wow. Like, I mean, if that's true, that's saying something. Well, we should talk about Oppenheimer sometime too, but that's not going to be today. Yeah. Um, cause I, I'll have to see that film. Oh, that one's really long though. It's Christopher Nolan. I feel like uh, that one's like an obligation for me. I feel like I'm yeah. in some way obligated to see that film. There's no way I'm seeing it in the theater though. I don't, oh, well, have, no, the, no, I don't no. have the attention span for that. I can't sit in a the theater that long. No. Uh, so that'll, uh, that'll have to wait for a video. Yeah. Um, Redbox or Netflix or Prime or something. <laughs> something you that way you can take it in doses. <laughs> yeah, exactly. When I get bored, I can like stop and walk away and yeah. come back later. Um, but I thought that what we would talk about tonight, so that I didn't have to get too embroiled in like catching up on news. Yeah, uh, was just the First Amendment stuff. Yeah, and which one is that? <laughs> it's the first one. <laughs> okay, it's the first one. All yeah. right. <laughs> Uh, that's good to know. Well, okay, so we had talked a, a few times about just like going through the amendments, yeah, the the Bill of Rights one by one, and, absolutely, and um and spending some time talking about each one and why they were important and what they were really about and and so forth. Of course, we have spent a ton of time on a few of the amendments over the course of this podcast, yeah, in various ways. The Second Amendment has gotten obviously a lot of play. Um, it's one of my favorites. Yeah, the tenth, the the fifth, the fourth. The I don't fourth. know, man. Honestly, the tenth might even be one of my favorite. I mean, it's definitely on the list. Like, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I love them all, but <laughs> well, and we've spent a lot, a lot of time on the Fourth Amendment, just because of the privacy stuff that keeps coming up. Oh yeah. And uh, and we've talked about the First Amendment plenty, but you know, we're gonna start with the old quiz. Cool. Um, can you name all five of the natural rights codified in the First Amendment? Yeah. Can you, you asking me? Yeah, I'm asking you. Do nah, your best. I, I, I ain't got it, dude. All mm. right. Well, what do, what do you have? Um, you're gonna have to fill in the blanks here, dude. I okay. Don't know. Um. All right. So the first part of it is the uh, freedom of religion. Okay. All right. So um, the state won't establish a religion or prohibit the exercise free exercise of any religion. Um, it will, uh, make no laws abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. Yeah. So that's two and three. Gotcha. Um, the right to assemble peaceably. Okay. And then, uh, the, um, right to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Yeah. All right. So, um, those are the five rights codified in the first amendment and the, they're all probably under fire, really. Yeah. But, um, so, I, I mean, we can suss this out a little bit. Uh, the the religion thing... Now, I, I hear a lot of people talk about this one in the context of COVID, them shutting down churches and so forth. I was, that was going to bring that up. That that's, that's something that comes up a lot. Yeah, I, I don't know that this amendment actually, like, prevents the government from... Shutting down churches. Shutting down churches. Yeah. Now, not to justify shutting down churches. That's not what I mean. <laughs> but um, 
but the the closing of churches as a blanket thing that they were doing is because they were shutting down everything. Yeah. Um, it doesn't actually prevent you from exercising your religion. Yeah. So just because you can't go to church, it's, it's not like they're, they're persecuting Christians or Muslims or Catholics or whatever. Well, the, the, they're not saying you can't practice your religion. They're just saying you can't come here. Yeah. Which is not the same thing. It's not, but I mean, it's still, I think your point that you're trying to make is it's, it's still a government overreach. It's just not a first amendment overreach. So like, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, the government shouldn't be telling any person on private property how they can operate on that private property. Like, that's my problem, is that that the government, like, if I wanted to call, call my house a church all of a sudden and mm-hmm. have a bunch of people come over to it, I don't think the government should be like, well, no, you can't have a church here. Yeah. Like, well, they weren't saying that you couldn't have a church here. They were just saying you couldn't have people in it. <laughs> But still, though, like, <laughs> but uh, okay. So now I get your I get your point, but um, at the same time, there's a bit of a trade off that people that churches have made, yeah, by accepting tax breaks. Well, that's fair. I mean, I think everybody should have those same tax breaks. Like, I want oh, the no. same <laughs> tax rights that my church has. <laughs> a- absolutely agree, but. Um, I mean, you are, it's that same kind of problem that you run into anytime you accept government services that you have to do what they say or they take away the service. Yeah. Yeah. And in this case, they took away the service. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, um, the, the next thing is uh, freedom of speech. Yeah. And um, I, I do want to kind of point out the reason that this, comes up right now i guess is that we had we recently had the censorship thing in um in the house in congress with uh rfkj and all that uh but more than once and the the president has said the same thing in relation to the second amendment um but more than once during that hearing uh somebody in congress said that um that the rights are not absolute yeah. And uh <laughs> I, are you going to disagree with that? I'm going to disagree with that. <laughs> I I'm going to say that rights absolutely are absolute because that's what makes them rights. If they weren't absolute, then they wouldn't be rights. Yeah. Uh, a right is by definition absolute. No, you've got it all wrong. Rights are gifts from the government. And well, you should be happy to have any. That, I mean, that's kind of the point, right? Is that if um, if a right is not absolute, then it's not a right at all. It's just a privilege that's granted by the government, and that means that it can also be taken away. Absolutely. So, speech is the the right to free speech is absolute. Now, that doesn't um, that just means that the government can't prohibit you from saying whatever it is that you want to say. Yeah. It doesn't mean that you're you're free from um, any kind of. Uh, liability for damages done by you exercising your rights in the same way that um, just because you have the right to bear arms, that doesn't free you of any liability if you shoot somebody. Yeah. Well, absolutely. Like you're still responsible for damages caused. Yeah. Um, well, and I think that's now where... That, and that's damages caused directly. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but so particularly in, when you're talking about speech, I, yeah. I can see how that would be important. Yes. Um, so you, you know, if you knowingly, and so you run into all kinds of problems, like, cause you don't know what's in somebody's head, whether they yeah. believed what they were saying or not. Yeah. Um, in most cases it shouldn't really even matter whether they believe what they're saying or not, but you have the example of, uh, shouting fire in a crowded theater. Now the idea that you don't have the right to shout fire in a crowded theater is, is fallacious. You do. Yeah. You yeah. absolutely have that right. Yeah. But you may be held liable for damages caused by you. The stampede. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Or for people missing their movie. I don't know that that (laughs) qualifies. qualifies. (laughs) Although, you know, movie prices keep going up. I don't know, man. You might (laughs) reach that standard at some point. What is it, $25? I I can't remember. Yeah, something like that. Anyway, um, so you can express any idea that you want to express. 
Period. Yeah. The government cannot prohibit you from expressing your ideas, yeah. even if they're stupid. Yeah. Like, even if they're wrong, even if you're lying. Yeah, all right. <laughs> they can't stop you from expressing your ideas. Um, and then the press is the second part of that. And I, I know that we brought this up a lot because because media is now seen as a particular industry. So people look at that statement in the First Amendment and they think that when you say you have freedom of the press, they mean the collection of journalists, the, the journalism industry has freedom. But no, when they wrote this thing, they were literally talking about the printing press. Yeah. What they were saying is that the government can't limit your distribution of your ideas, no matter how stupid they are, or even if they're lies. Yeah. Um, so those two things go together. You have the freedom to express, hold and exp All right. So the religion part is that you can hold any idea that you want. Okay. Um, the speech part is that you can express any idea that you want. Yeah. And the press part is that you can disseminate any idea that you want. Yeah. And the, the government can't limit any of those things. I still think the religion one, I still have to disagree with you about the COVID thing, because I do think that like as part of any religion, like you should have the right to gather with your people as part of that religion. Well, I, I think that you could maybe make the argument that they abridged the, the first amendment um, with the fourth part, which is the freedom of assembly, freedom to peaceably assemble. Yeah, yeah. Well, by that, that by may, shutting down churches. Okay, so maybe that's the argument you make over the freedom of religion. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's not that they were preventing you from keeping your religion. Yeah. They just said that you couldn't go to this particular place to do it. And, yeah. and actually on that note, to just give another example of how you're not uh, protected from liability, even though you can hold whatever, they, they can't prohibit you from holding a belief, but they the, you're also not protected from liability by these amendments. Um, take like if you're, uh, I don't know, some kind of, um, all right, I'm just going to say like Satanism. Okay. Like, okay. Yeah. If you're a Satanist, something that's appalling to yeah, most people, yeah. the, the government can't stop you from being a Satanist, but you can still be held liable if you like steal people's pets and sacrifice them. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> right? yeah, yeah, like that, but that that's goes, a different law that you're... Well, yeah, it, that's a property on. rights thing. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You, so, you've got to buy those pets before you sacrifice them. <laughs> <laughs> Precisely. <laughs> um, so then the, the last one is to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Now, this has already been abridged in a, in a huge way. You cannot sue the federal government without their permission. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, but... Anyway, the, the point is that the First Amendment, it, its purpose is to protect th your thoughts, your opinions, and the expression of them. Yeah. And, and it is an absolute right, because all rights are absolute. All, all things that are really rights. All natural rights. Are absolute. Yeah. Well, if it's not a natural right, it's not a right. What about uh, my right to clean water? Nope, no such thing. <laughs> what about my right to health care? You're, you're <laughs> welcome to clean your water, though. Oh, okay. Well, I'm glad I'm yeah. glad the government allows me to do that. And you don't have a right to health care either. And if you want to try and take up those issues right now, which I didn't really no, intend to. I'm, I'm just trying to pull you around. <laughs> you know, um, I would just say that any kind of, uh, any kind of positive rights right that, like that um, require any, anything that you would call a right cannot require somebody else's labor. Yeah. yeah. Because if you're requiring somebody else's labor to fulfill your quote unquote right, then you're essentially conscripting them. Yeah. Like you're forcing them to do, I mean, you may not actually be forcing them, but essentially what you're saying is that if, um, in order to fulfill your rights, somebody else has to do something for you. Yeah. And if they have to, if they don't have a choice in this, then you're obviously abridging their rights. Absolutely. Which means that it can't be a right for you. I felt like that was something important to bring up, though, given the conversation we're having with rights, because there is a difference between, like, your natural rights are, like, what you're saying. Like, mm -hmm. they're, they're solid and absolute. Um, but people conflate that a lot of times by calling stuff rights that aren't. Yeah. Um, Things that they want. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and, or things that they want to be provided for them. Yeah. As as much as anything else. Absolutely. Um. So I, I'm I'm gonna throw a, a a quote from Sam Samuel Adams. Ooh, my favorite beer. Out here. 
Um, and then I'm probably going to follow it up with another quote, but we'll see. All right. um, so Samuel Adams said, among the rights of the colonists are these, first, life, secondly, liberty, third, property, together with the right to protect and defend them in the best means possible. Absolutely. And and so that's what, you know, the, the natural rights, these these ideas, they all stem from, I mean, I'm not going to go deeply into the roots of natural rights theory here either. Uh, yeah. We've done it before, we've first off. It. Yeah. And yeah. secondly, like, this is a big topic. But a like, little refresher can't hurt. Yeah. Um, but they all extend from the right to life. And yeah. and it's essentially the idea that the, the, the entity with the greatest moral claim over your body is you. Absolutely. All right. And then um, the, the products of your labor as well as your property, you know, it, it extends from that. Um, and then all of these rights extend from there. So you have control of your own mind is what we're talking about in the, in the first amendment yeah. that you have the right to, uh, form your own thoughts, opinions, and express them and disseminate them. It's all in your own head. The government has no control there, yeah. none whatsoever. And of course the roots of the natural right theory, it, depending on whether you're religious or not, um, they either extend from the idea that you control yourself, that you have the greatest moral, um, right to to claim dominion i guess you would say over yourself yeah uh or that god does and so if you're religious then you would say that the natural rights proceed from from god um and if you're not religious then you would say that your natural rights proceed from your existence your individual existence as a human yeah um and that what's yours is yours and the first thing that's yours is your body yeah yourself You're, i yeah. guess it's because it's body and mind yeah. and spirit i suppose yeah um so an, another coral area that that i think is important to to point out here um is that there are no collective rights yeah rights are are individual it's it's an individual's rights and the you know of course in the declaration of independence we say that the purpose of a government is to protect and defend those rights yeah. for each individual. And that's the only purpose of government. That's the only just purpose of government. Yeah. Of course they overstepped that tremendously in this country. <laughs> right. but, Trample. Um, and so, you know, I'm going to turn into, I'm going to switch over to like spook language here yeah. um, and say, why is this important <laughs> that, yeah. that rights are individual rights, not that there are no collective rights. Yeah. Um, and the, the answer to that is th that the, the individual, okay, I guess it's, it's like the difference between looking at people as means or ends. Okay. Right? So if you believe in collective rights, you think, you believe that you can subvert an individual's rights in order to achieve a greater good for the collective. Okay. Do you understand what I mean? Kind of. So um, that you can... You can conscript somebody to perform a particular duty to to benefit the collective against their will. Okay. So the individual I, like, doesn't yeah. have a choice in the matter. It, yeah. th it's no longer voluntary for them that they if if collective rights exist, then as as something greater certainly than the individual rights. So like in in reference to churches, like mm -hmm. do churches not have rights as a church? No. Okay. Churches do not have rights. Like it's not even human. Well, yeah, but I mean, I mean, how can a how can a, a system or um, a a corporation have rights of its own? I don't know. It, it, I don't know specifically, but it just feels like they should. <laughs> like it seems like they should have it. So maybe I'm not thinking of rights. Maybe I'm thinking of like protections. Maybe. Okay, yeah, protections is something different. Yeah, and maybe that's where kind of my disconnect but even, is. E no, even there, though, like the right to free exercise of religion is an individual right. Yeah. Now, if you choose to exercise it collectively to get together with a community to do all do this thing together, yeah. there's nothing obviously prohibiting that. Yeah. But the right isn't to the community. The right is to each of the individuals to voluntarily grouped together if I guess they want. I can I can understand that like that yeah. makes sense to me um and there's uh the people as ends or means thing is like a real moral question yeah um if you 
if you subsume individual rights into collective rights, what you're saying is that the the individual's rights aren't important. The the group achievement is the important thing. Yeah. Um, and what that reduces people to is being means to an end. Yeah. To some collective end, sure. Yeah. But means to an end, not ends of in and of themselves. And if you're talking about pe- looking at people as means to an end, you're talking about people as tools. Yeah. yeah. You're, you're, and in fact, I guess in more colloquial language, you're talking about using people. Yeah. And I think that we can all understand that there's a problem with that. Absolutely. Except for the sociopaths out there. <laughs> right. And and in fact, like in my in my personal life, I was kind of confronted with this recently that there was something that I wanted to fight for st- still want to fight for but my actions were limited by my belief that people are ends unto themselves yeah like that you you can't use people as a means to an end to it, achieve some goal for yourself yeah yeah people are not pawns right yeah um and I think that this is a this is a really important point, and this actually kind of leads into uh, problems with democracy. Mm. Um, but before we move into that, I'll just finish finish with this, um, which is a, a quote from Albert Camus, who said, uh, "Freedom is not a gift received from the state." Absolutely. Um, the the rights of rights pre exist and exist outside of government. Yeah. The purpose of government is to protect rights, not to create them. They don't create them. The, the rights are already there. Yeah. The goal is to protect those rights. Yeah. That's the only just purpose of government. Absolutely. Um, and the yeah, the the rights exist outside of it. They're not they're not granted by government. They're not created by government. And in fact, um, there is no authority whatsoever in the Constitution to either define, regulate, or limit individual rights. And in fact, everything in the Constitution related to rights is about how the government cannot infringe on them. Absolutely. And it leaves it very open with things like the Ninth Amendment that says that just because we didn't mention it as a right here doesn't mean that it isn't one. Yeah, all right. <laughs> we are not defining all rights. The yeah. rights are not defined by the Constitution. The rights pre-exist the Constitution. The Constitution yeah. was formed to try and protect them. Absolutely. And not the other, because a lot of people twist all of that around and think that the mm-hmm. Constitution is, a, I guess, a way to protect the government. Or the, the that... Well, um, it, it's what they... <laughs> The I guess the argument is that um, if it's not defined in the Constitution, it's up the, to the government to define to it. To define it, yeah. yeah. Which is why the Ninth Amendment might be the most important amendment, yeah. by the way, because it's the it is the one that says just because we didn't specify it here doesn't mean that it that the government can intrude upon it. Absolutely, yeah. Um, but a lot of people look at it as well. It doesn't say in the Constitution that government can't do this. Yeah. So government can, but. Actually, the Constitution very explicitly is about what the government can do, and anything outside of that yeah. is prohibited. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so in, in terms of democracy, like when you start looking at it from the perspective of uh, individual rights exist, but collective rights don't, this is one of the problems that you run into in democracy is that... Um, that essentially what it says is that the, and this, it's always so funny to me. I, I know I'm, I'm not finishing my sentence here, but um, it's, it's always very funny to me that people on the left um, tout democracy as a good in and of itself. Yeah. That democracy well, moralizes whatever is being done. And well, it, well as long as time, it's one of their things. Because, well, that's true. But, but the the point is that they they tend to people on the left tend to be um, very strongly supportive of minority protections. Yeah. Whereas democracy does exactly the opposite. Like yeah. a pure democracy essentially says that the majority can oppress and exploit the minority. Yeah. By virtue of a vote. Yep. yep. Well, we all agreed. I mean, not you. But enough of us. Yeah, fifty one percent thought that you know this was <laughs> that fine. we should be able to take this property from exactly. You. So here we come. Yeah, um, which is the importance of a constitution, 
Uh, and it's the importance of the def- of the difference between a republic and a democracy. Well, yeah, we we were not a democracy, very intentional. Like that was mm-hmm. not like an accident. You know, the founders understood all of this. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it does a okay. So we've already expressed that it's oppressive for minorities. Um, without if you leave out the recognition and the respect for individual rights and property. Yeah. Which government, which government will always do. Will always do. And most people will, too, given well, yeah. the opportunity. No, well, that's I mean, true. It, it become, well, I, I'll get back to that. I, I just want to give a couple of examples. I'm throwing out a lot of quotes tonight. <laughs> um, but one of my favorites is the Ben Franklin quote. The, he says, uh, democracy is two wolves and a lamb voting on what to have for lunch. Oh, one of my favorite quotes. I love that quote. And, and so the example that I always give to people when I get into a debate about the virtues of democracy with, with somebody is... Uh, so, all right, listener out there, yeah. um, imagine you go to dinner every week with me and Liberty Larry. Yeah. And every week at the end of dinner, we have a vote over who's going to pay the bill. Yeah. And every week, me and Liberty Larry vote for you to pay the bill. <laughs> Sounds like a fair plan to me. Yeah. So does the, the fact that we had a vote about it, that a majority of us agreed, yeah. does that make it right? That you yeah. have to pay the bill every single week because, I mean, we voted. Yeah, seems fair to me. I'm just saying. And to give a broader example, um, imagine if we uh, if we voted on a whole bunch of measures, policies, or whatever to um, oppress and exploit children. Yeah. Now I, I like this example particularly because children don't get to vote. Yeah. All right, so. Um, in this country, a democracy, we, we vote on all kinds of measures um, to uh, oppress and exploit children. Now, is that right? Absolutely not. Now, okay, so the problem, obviously, is that the children aren't participating in the democracy here. Yeah. Well, let's just give the children the right to vote. Does that fix the problem? No, yeah. because we still outnumber the children. Yeah. And yeah. we can still continue to vote to oppress and exploit the children. Just because they have a vote doesn't justify the action. Absolutely. Because right. there's just more of us than there are of them. Yeah. So um, I, I think that I look at democracy on a large scale, and, and here's a big difference between the two scenarios that I just gave, um, is that that dinner thing, Yeah. Like you can just stop going to dinner with me and Larry. Yeah, very simple solution. Yeah. It, yeah, you you have a voluntary part in this, and then we got to find somebody else to coax out with us. Exactly, <laughs> um, listener number two. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> and but the the difference between a a, a large scale dem- democratic system like we have in the United States is that you can't opt out. Yeah, you're in. Yeah, especially at the federal level, which yeah. is the the reason we talk so much about like government at home Mm -hmm. decentralized 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 because at the end of the day even if you decentralize down to just a state level Mm -hmm. like you can switch states like it's not unreasonable to think that well i don't like what's going on in alabama i'm gonna go move to florida kentucky kentucky yeah exactly (laughs) i mean it's it's not it's not an out there idea um but as far as with the federal government like there's It's just not realistic. Like, okay, I'm going to go move to another country, you know, like, okay. Mexico. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Everybody wants to be in Mexico these days. So you think so? (laughs) No, no, I don't. don't Imagine it's pretty hot there. I don't want to go to Canada either. No. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Um, So, yeah, the beyond the fact that it is a system that expressly in a pure democracy expressly um, is built to allow a majority to oppress and exploit a minority. Yeah. Um, You also have uh, the problem of perverse incentives for elected officials. Yeah. So um, I I recommend everybody, well, a lot of people are going to hear this and they're going to say, there's no way I would ever read that. (laughs) But there's a really great economics book by Ooh. Hans Hermann Hoppe yeah. called Democracy, the God that Failed. I was waiting for that to come up. <laughs> yeah. So the, the paradigm he sets up is he looks at, um, at 
a monarchy as a privately owned government yeah. and a democracy as a publicly owned government. Yeah. And then he assesses the economic impacts of these two forms of government. Yeah. And the, the result that he comes to, and this is a, like a long historical study actually, but um, the result he comes to is that uh, economically the monarchy is far better for the nation yeah. than a democracy is. And the reason being that a private owner and this is just like in every other case of public versus private. Yeah. Um, the private owner has an incentive to grow the wealth of the entire nation state. Yeah. To, to grow the wealth of their territory because they get to benefit from the resources acquired and they get to pass it on to their progeny. Absolutely. All right. The problem that you come to economically with a publicly owned government is that the officials can only um, exploit the resources of the government for the time that they're in it, in power. Yeah, yeah. the The time that they are officials of the government. So instead of there being an incentive to grow the wealth of the the state over time to benefit themselves and everybody else, the incentive that's created is for them to extract as many resources from the state as they can during the time that they have access to it. Exactly. And we see that. Oh, absolutely. You um, see that. I mean, it, just like, just look at the Biden issues that are going on right now yeah. that it, it's starting to look like there has been decades of the Biden family exploiting the power. Um, and that he, or the influence that he has, he had access to while during his time in government to um, increase their own wealth at the expense of everybody else. Yeah, and the, there's plenty of them that, like the Clintons, are another prime example mm -hmm. of that. Yeah, I mean, I, well, and I was talking with my mom about this the other day. I would say the Bushes are no better, but anyway. I, yeah, I agree. Anyway, yeah. Um, and well, okay, so the example that that we brought up when I was talking with mom, because I said, I think that this is, I mean, like the, the Bidens seem to have been like pretty brazen about it. Yeah. But I don't think this is uncommon at all. Oh, absolutely. And you see it in the difference in, um, in wealth accumulated from people that are just entering government and people that are leaving government. Yeah. Like the different, like the amount of wealth that they have acquired during the time that they are in government is excessive. And yeah. so the example that, that my mom brought up was Jeff Sessions. Oh yeah. So he was a U.S. attorney before he was a senator. Um, and then and now he, he's nothing. But when he, he uh left the U.S. attorney and became a senator, his net worth was something like one point one million dollars or something like that. Yeah. When he left the federal government, his net worth was like seven point four million dollars. Yeah. And he wasn't getting that off of his government salary. Yeah, he's getting paid what three hundred thousand a year, roughly. Something it's like less that. than that. It's like two hundred and I don't remember what the number yeah. is two hundred and twenty, two hundred forty, something like that. <laughs> um, now I, I think that most of it's done through insider trading and and things like that. Uh, Generally, yeah. Rather well, because than, these people through, have access to information, and there's right. no, there's actually no rules against that. Like yeah. they're allowed to do that. But I have no doubts either that a lot of it's bribes. Oh, absolutely. You know, like legal bribes, lobbying, but, yeah. you know, bribes all the same. Um, and uh, and mom was like, you know, and I thought Jeff Sessions was one of the good ones. I was like, well, I never liked the guy, but... <laughs> I never thought he was one of the good ones. <laughs> yeah, but, um, I, I, but I understand your point that you would think, like, you know, the him being in the U.S. Attorney's Office, you might believe that he was a... Honorable person. Yeah, somebody with integrity or whatever. But... Yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah, that, that's the point is that they have an incentive to extract as much wealth as they can yeah. while they have access to the resources. Yeah. Um, it creates perverse incentives. Absolutely. Uh, I'm sure that there's a lot more that I wanted to say about that, but I can't think of, I can't think of anything right now. Where was well, I? I the, had planned. The, the point I would say is that, the point here is not necessarily that we need a monarchy. No, 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 absolutely it, not. It's, but it's but, about voluntarism. But it's about it's an illustration of the difference between the two types of government. Mm -hmm. And the and the I think the big takeaway here should be not that we need a monarchy or we need a republic or exactly anything mm -hmm. like that. Is that we need the government to be small. 
Yes. Like we, the, we don't need... Small a, and dispersed. Exactly. Um, um, decentralized as much as possible. And, and, and that even as an about, anarchist myself, like mm-hmm. I don't want... I don't think that there will ever be no government. Like I think you just look for the smallest and go with that. I want everybody to go back to the beginning of this podcast and listen to me <laughs> and Liberty Larry argue about anarchism. Yeah, yeah, I've switched, but this, <laughs> but exactly what we're talking about is a big reason why. Well, I, I did want to say a little bit more about uh, democracy in that case, and um, what I wanted to say is I actually think that democracy on a large scale like this is a control mechanism. Yeah. It's really just a control mechanism. It um, it creates an outlet for the losers to say, well, you know, things were fair. Uh, my side just didn't win. Yeah. I mean, I don't think people actually like. We should really have tried harder. That, like next that, time, we'll fair. rally like, more people. You know, like, uh, make a better argument. Yeah, you know, whatever it happens yeah. to be. Um, and for the uh, for the winners, obviously, first off, they're the winners. So. You know, that makes them feel pretty good. But it also gives them a moral excuse for exploiting the minority. Yeah. That they can take because, well, I mean, we agreed as a group that this is the way to go. And, you know, what better way to decide than to have everybody choose and whichever side has the most gets their way. And that makes it moral. Yeah. And, uh, And the truth is that we don't actually really get to vote on anything of any real import. Oh, absolutely. In this kind, of, when yeah. was the last time you voted on whether to go to war or whether to increase the money supply or yeah. whether um, particular corporations should get various benefits or how your tax laws should change? When was the last time you got to vote on anything of any real import well, in and, your life? And the war one is an interesting one in particular because mm-hmm. if you go back through the last what maybe half a dozen presidents, they almost all of them ran on a anti-war platform and people forget that because they all ended up being war presidents i mean all the way back to bush and clinton and all of these all the way guys back to world war ii like i mean you just go back you start looking at them you but if go you back look, a century yeah you look at their campaigns they all mm-hmm. ran on an anti-war platform yeah but didn't conduct their presidency that way yeah um, and that should be enough right there on its own to tell you that the, it just doesn't work, mm-hmm. at least at least on the scale. And that's really kind of my point is like, so, yeah, you, I think democracy at your local, you know, city government is one thing. But on the scale that we're using it as a country, especially with the country with the size of power that we have, yeah. um, our, our government with the size of power that it has. Uh, because you end up with a situation where every four years each side's fighting for the ring, you know, like mm-hmm. who's gonna who's gonna rule over who the next four years, you know? Yeah, well, I mean that's a that's a that's actually really a separate problem. That's just a matter of of the power of government generally. Yeah. Um. And yeah, but the that my that my it, point is is that the the government needs to be be brought mm-hmm. down, like. Yeah, I mean, it goes back to the uh, Thomas Massey's things. Like, you never give government a power that you wouldn't give to your worst enemy. Yeah. Because chances are, sometime in the future, your worst enemy will have it. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I always like to take that to the next level, that the government is your worst enemy. Yes. So. <laughs> but. Yeah, but I, I think it is, Im- the importance here, it, it's not that I'm dismissing democracy as a tool. Yeah. Um, I think that it can be a valuable tool. Um, the The problem is that it doesn't justify the results. Yeah. The fact of taking a vote does not mean does not. Yeah, does not justify um, the any action that's taken as a result of the of the choice of the majority. Yeah. Um, you know, you got to think that there. In fact, it's been used badly in this country. Um, yeah. throughout history. Uh, a majority of people thought that the people, Americans of Japanese descent should be kept in internment camps during World War II. Yeah. yeah. That doesn't make it moral. Yeah. I mean, it didn't work out well in Germany that during that time period either. <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, like, say what you will, but like... Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, so, the... Just, you know, be aware. And I, I've even, like, toyed with ideas of uh, 
okay, democracy, but it has to be unanimous. Yeah. I but, think it, and I think actually, that's probably the best thing that I could come up with just because nothing would ever happen. Well, I think it's just, a, <laughs> I think it's really just a matter of scale that mm-hmm. if is like local city, maybe even state government ran off of some kind of republic form of democracy mm-hmm. mixed thing is probably all right because just like your dinner analogy, like there's always kind of the opt out there. Yeah. Like, I mean, if things really get that bad in your area, you can just leave. Mm-hmm. Um, but once, once you build the scale up to the size of the federal government, then the opt out thing just kind of becomes moot. Like, yeah. You know, well, ideally everything would become, would be voluntarist. Yeah. That we would all exist as individuals and that we would interact or not with each other as we chose. Yeah. Um, and that all interactions would be voluntary. Um, well, and dissolving the federal government just fixes so many of those problems because people, I mean, believe it or not, like people want to live like they live in California, even though people are fleeing there, they did kind of create that on their own, you know? What do you mean? Just the, like live like how live like w- with a big obtrusive government that controls everything and mm-hmm. that that regulates everything and taxes you into oblivion. Yeah, you think people want to live that way? Well, I don't think that they want to, but they've allowed that government to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, clearly, a lot of people don't want to live that way because they're fleeing California yeah. in droves. <laughs> well, and it's not just California, but that's the obvious example. Mm-hmm. I, I think that that's actually the problem, and that that's what drove it is that they kept enough of them an, enough people would say that they wanted resources taken from this group to be given to this group. Yeah, and it happened over and over and over again, over again to the point where every group feels like they're being exploited. Yeah, yeah. To the point that people just leave. Yeah, to the point yeah. where they're like, "Well, I'd rather go somewhere else where my property is mine." Yeah. And then go vote the same. And then, well, yeah. I mean, they never, the, the problem is that, that when it comes down to it, um, people are happy to use the coercive power of government to achieve their own ends. Yeah. yeah. And, that, and that most people look at other people as means to an end. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know that. Well, Maybe that's and, not fair. I say truth, most people. The I, truth I hope is, that that's not true. Most people just haven't thought about it as deep as we are on this podcast tonight. Like, I mean, that's well, definitely yeah. a factor. And people get tricked. Yeah. I mean, the, the government always has the interest of, of accumulating more power. And so what they do is they make promises to people about what they can provide to them. If only they give them this extra power. Yeah. And people don't look into it deeply enough to to understand how it can affect them adversely in the long run. Yeah. Um, it, it, even to the point of, all right, so we're we're going to build this bureaucratic system to provide this particular relief or that particular relief or whatever, and and everybody will give just a little bit, and that way we'll take care of these problems. But right. people don't even calculate in the like, well, what's the cost of just the bureaucracy to maintain that? Like beyond. <laughs> Yeah. What it what it's actually like providing to this group or that group or whatever, yeah. just the bureaucracy to maintain it has a cost of its own. Oh, absolutely. And so you're giving more than you're getting out of it every time. Yeah. It's, it's essentially like every time you create a new bureaucracy, you can just kind of assume that you're giving an extra 10% beyond what you need to give to achieve the goal that you want so that you can pay the people that are administering it. Yeah. And uh, I, I think I'm actually it's being not, conservative with the 10%. It's not, yeah, <laughs> it's not a very effective <laughs> yeah. means to an end. Uh, so, you know, the problem, all, if, you, if you trace it far enough, the problem always terminates in government. Oh, absolutely. Like, government is always the origin. Yeah. And so, you know, you look at the problems created by government during COVID because of shutdowns and and you know, closing industries and so forth. And it created a huge problem, a huge economic crisis in this country. And the answer then was, well, we'll print up a bunch of money and give it to everybody that needs it. Yeah. And that seems like a great result at the time. Like, okay, well, I mean, you put me out of work 
at least you're giving me a few thousand dollars, which doesn't cover your expenses, yeah, but, but it's something. Yeah, at least, you know, it, it's something's more than nothing. Yeah. But now we're here yeah. where that dollar that they gave you yeah. is worth so much less than it was. Exactly. And so now you're, you know, you've, you've created an even bigger problem. You've created a bigger bubble. You've created more of a long-term issue um, where, you know, there are people talking about like economic apocalypse in this country at this point. Now, I don't, it's going to be worse than the last one. Yeah. Because the bubble's that much bigger. Oh, yeah. So just think of the hard times in 2008, 2009 after the, the crash then. Well, and there's it's no... It's going to be worse this time. Yeah. And your dollar's already worth less. Yeah, exactly. Well, and they they don't have... They're working on trying to fix this problem, but they can't just drop the rates down like they did in 08, 09. Well, they did bring them up some, so... They're slowly bringing them up, but it's not going to be enough for yeah, when the it crash happens. Yeah, fix the problem. Yeah, exactly. Not that it fixed the problem last time. It just kind of kicked it down the road. Yeah. So. I mean, it created enough. For, well, I mean, even still, it was something like 8 million people lost their jobs in a year. 6 yeah. million people lost their homes. Yeah. And I mean, I don't know that it'll affect the housing market in the same way that it did last time. Um, I actually think it's going to. I think that it's probably going to be worse for older people. Yeah. Um, because I think that the, the real crisis is going to be in bonds. I think that, yeah. I think that retirement savings is what's really going to, what's going to take a hit. Yeah. What's going to take the biggest hit. Yeah. Now housing is also going to be, I mean, it's, 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 gonna it's be never going to be a, yeah. 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 I, I think it's going to be a general, um, depression. Yeah. Recession, whatever. Yeah. I, I don't know. We'll see. Uh, well, I don't know I, at what point it becomes not if, a recession anymore if, and if now a depression. But yeah, if you start just look at it historically, we're due for a depression. Like yeah, if you if you believe in hundred recession, well, oh, I don't know year depression. Yeah, yeah, if you believe in hundred year cycles. Like, yeah, I I don't. Uh, I mean, I think that these I think that these cycles are manufactured by monetary policy. Yeah, I, I don't even think the worst part is that I don't think that they do it intentionally. Well, no, I don't think I, they, I, I don't think, think they do it intentionally either. It, like, it's only the Austrian economists that have an explanation for this, and everybody else just kind of dismisses it. Yeah. Um, but the Austrians are onto something. Oh, I've always yeah, that's that's my school, man. <laughs> you know that it, it's this expansion of credit and the monetary supply that creates the bubbles that leads to the recessions. Yeah. And then they just pump it all back in again and do the same thing all over. Yeah. Because they don't think that they're the cause. Yeah. They think it's capitalism. Yeah. <laughs> they, they think it's greedy corporations as if there's any time that corporations aren't greedy. Yeah. yeah exactly. Um, that there's, you know, it, it can't be them. They're fixing the problem. Yeah. But, you know, the Austrians say that the, the Federal Reserve and the Treasury are creating the problem. They're creating the business cycle. Absolutely. And, and I think that they're right. Yeah. And maybe we should spend a whole episode just talking about Austrian business cycle theory sometime. But that would be um, fun. I, I do think that the 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 group that's going to take the biggest hit is going to be older people and retired people in this next one. Yeah. Um, I, I think the bond market's the one that's really bad. Yeah. At, at this point, and um, so retirement savings will just disappear. Yeah. And it'll force people to work much longer than they expected. And the people that are already retired are going to have to go back to work, but there's not going to be jobs for them. Yeah. yeah. And, well, and they're not going to be as capable to do the jobs that are available anyway. True. Um, and not, I'm not even talking about physically. I'm just talking about like technologically. I mean, you're, you're older. <laughs> Say that again. <laughs> yeah, no, no thanks. Um, <laughs> right. But your older community just isn't as savvy when it comes to a computer and a phone, mm -hmm. you know. Well, and they're already being replaced. I mean, workers are already being replaced by those things. Exactly. So, so um, I, I think that that's where the real problem's gonna gonna be. And I'm, I, I'm sorry. Like I hope. Yeah. You know, you tell people to prepare for retirement, but then the the government makes a bunch of decisions that just, you know. Uh, eliminates everything well, that you've done. I was gonna say. I mean, even the people that have done the right thing and and prepared can take a beating in this. Yeah. The federal you know. reserve, you know, makes all these decisions that just dissolve. Yeah. Everything. Like all the preparation that you made. Yeah. I mean, I worry about that for myself. Like I'm nowhere near ready for retirement yet, mm -hmm. but, but I've got a retirement plan rolling. Yeah. And 
like I say, I, I worry about that tremendously. Yeah, I mean, just think about if your IRA or 401k is suddenly worth half what it is now. Exactly. And yeah. that the half that, it, that it's worth at that point, those dollars are worth less also. Yeah. Well, that's my big, my biggest fear is inflation. Like that's, mm -hmm. I think that's what, hidden I mean, tax. it's, it's the hidden tax and it's mm -hmm. a big one. Like it's not like minute. Yeah. That, um, all right. He's checking but, the time. Yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> you know, we're, we're, I'm going to run long if I tell this story, but, um, but I'm going to tell it anyway. We're going to do it. Yeah. So, uh, are you familiar with Peter Schiff? I am. Yeah. Okay. You know, his dad, Erwin Schiff. Er Erwin Schiff yeah. was a, like, he was an insurance salesman, but then he became an investor um, or something. I, I, I can't just remember, remember exactly. his dad had an interesting story, but I don't remember what it was. Well, he was a big, um, he was a big crusader against taxes. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. And he ended up like he, he was the one that he really pushed the, like he had a Didn't whole business end? set up around teaching people how to legally avoid taxes. Yeah. Um, the, the federal government disagreed though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but he was a big advocate of the, like he did the fifth amendment approach to taxes. Yeah. Um, that, uh, you know, I, I cannot be required by the government to turn in information about my income yeah. um, because I, I cannot be forced to incriminate myself in a sense is yeah. the, the approach a that he was taking is like the argument yeah. that, yeah, um, I cannot be, uh, I cannot be required to tell the government what I owe it. Yeah. Yeah. Essentially. Um, and, Which, by but the way, he ended up dying in jail. On I was going to say, I, re I remember that much charges. that he had heard, I'd heard he had died in jail, but he wrote this Comic is probably the best way to describe it, actually, called yeah. The Kingdom of Molts, yeah. um, which is about how inflation is created. And he gives a really like interesting alternative example of this country who bases its taxes on the height of your house. Uh -huh. yeah. And so um, houses that are over 15 feet, you pay this much in taxes, this many gold pieces or whatever. Yeah. And if it's over 25 feet, then there's an additional percentage. And if it's over 30 feet, then it's additional, you know, so yeah. it's like creating this get graduated tax plan yeah. essentially based on the height of your house. And so he says, of course the result is that the vast majority of houses in Moltz are 14 feet, 11 inches. Oh yeah. Because you don't start being taxed until you're at 15 feet. Oh, well there you go. And so then the next one is the, they're 24 feet, 11 inches because the next level the is next 25 bracket. feet and yeah. you know, so on. And so the, the kingdom is spending more money than they're making it, than they're bringing in, of course, because that's, that's what how governments, governments do. work. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, the, he, the king, um, calls all his advisors together to figure out what to do. And of course it, they never, discuss the possibility of maybe, you know, the king spending less money. Yeah. That's that, not an option. That doesn't come up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, not even considered. Yeah. Uh, but the, this brilliant advisor says, oh, well, what we can do is we can just change the length of a ruler. Oh, yeah. So a foot instead of 12 inches will be 10 inches in the future. <laughs> and since the, the this kingdom, the government, is the only source of rulers. Yeah. Uh, then we'll just change it and, um, and then we'll remeasure people's houses and then they'll fall into higher tax brackets and we can make more money that way. Yeah. And they're like, well, won't people notice? They're like, yeah, but I mean, what we'll do is we'll just outlaw the old versions of the rulers. <laughs> yeah. You know, if it's not government issued, you can't have it. And this is the only kind of ruler that the government's issuing. But at the same time, we can also measure all the people again. And so they'll feel taller and feel better and maybe it'll like, you know, Balance draw their out. attention away from the now that they're paying more taxes. But this is his illustration of inflation, that they take the measuring stick and yeah. they make it a little bit smaller. Yeah. But they still apply it in the same in way. Same way, yeah. And that's what the government's done with the money supply and yeah. why your dollar is just worthless. Yeah. It's, it's you know, my favorite uh, bumper sticker from Liberty Stickers, yeah. which is um, your uh, things don't cost more. Your money's just worthless because the government keeps counterfeiting. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's so true. And so we can wrap up there. I don't, <laughs> I don't yeah. have a more graceful way of ending, I suppose, yeah. at this point. But, um, you know, thanks for everybody understanding us taking a little bit of time off. 
And uh, I think that we feel kind of rejuvenated. I know I do. Yeah, me too. Um, and again, appreciate all the, the comments that people sent after the last episode. It's, it is just really nice to, it's nice to know that there are people out there. Absolutely. Uh, there's people on the other side of the microphone. Absolutely. Um, and so, you know, we've done a lot of these and, um, I suspect we'll continue to for a while. Do some more. Yep. Yeah. Cause while it sometimes seems like a chore, I do enjoy it. As do I. So, um, we'll plan to be, okay. So we've got some things coming up like next month and the month, month after, yeah. um, I got some trips planned and I've got you've some got trips, trips planned. And yeah. so we'll, we'll keep you informed as best we can. Um, at least one of my trips, uh, I may be able to do a recording with, uh, with GI Greg, who you may remember from a couple of Christmases ago, um, that would be awesome. when I'm out of town. Uh, but I, I'll see him. So like, maybe I can do a recording with him. Um, definitely should too. Like I'm going to, I'm going to like pressure this Okay. Know? because I know how it goes. Like you get up there and visit with him and you just get to the point where you don't feel like it. And I yeah. think, and I think y'all should do it. So yeah. Yeah. Like, I can, yeah, I can, I just got to remember to take the stuff up there yeah. and, uh, you know, but we have some things going on, but we'll, you know, we'll do the best we can to stay to stay regular. Absolutely. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll keep you informed uh, about, you know, when we plan to have things out. So, but at least right now, uh, we plan to be back next week. Next week should be good. Yeah. And uh, in the meantime, you can follow us on Facebook. You can subscribe on iTunes, YouTube, Podbean. Um, like and share, comment, uh, tell your friends, all those things. All the interaction helps us. Um, it helps us know that you're out there and it helps us get this information in front of more people. Absolutely. And, uh, and that, that's of course the goal is to reach as many people as we can. Yep. Mm-hmm. And, um, well, that's one of the goals. <laughs> <laughs> it's goal uh, one, right? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. So we'll, um, you'll hear from us again next week when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try to stay free. Life short, live free. Ciao. Later.